Michael, th thank you very much for your welcome. And thank you, um, er everyone, you've welcomed Erica, my wife, and me wonderfully well here this morning. And yes, it's been said, having met four of you from the church family here back in the summer, up at the, the, the training I was doing, it's a delight to, to meet the rest of you here. And I know there are others watching online and who can't be here today. Let me just tell you a bit more about myself. You've heard a little bit about it, but when there's a new preacher, you, everybody spends the first few minutes thinking, who, who is, I mean, who is he? What's he done? Where's he come from? Um, so, yes, my name is Tim Ward. I'm married to Erica, who's sitting here. We have one child, um, a son, Jonathan, who's 18. He, he's just started at university, and he's, he's back for the weekend. So we've had the weekend full of stories of, of how he's getting on. Uh, and um, he thinks he's found a church to settle in, so that's our greatest joy, that he's found a, a body of believers down in Bournemouth, where he's studying. Um, we live in Southgate, so just a couple of stops, up the Piccadilly line. Um, and I, as you've heard, I teach at a place called Oak Hill College. Um, we, do, we, we train people for gospel ministry. That, that's what we're there for. Um, I've been in theological education for about eight years. Before that, I was in local church ministry, so I'm, I'm an ordained Church of England minister. So I, I served in local church ministry in the Midlands and uh, down in Sussex in the south for, for 14 years. Before I, So I, I used to do the job, and now I'm kind of training people to do the job. But, I mean... There's a sense in which we're always members of a church family, first of all. So my wife and I were members of a church called Christ Church in Cockfosters. And Erica was particularly involved in evangelism and meeting with women um, to read the Bible with them. Um, one of my uh, roles in the church family there is I oversee uh, what we call our life groups, our, our midweek Bible study groups. So if you're wondering, wondering who, who is this guy, they, there you go. That, that always helps, doesn't it, when you're going to hear the word of God from someone. Now, the, the part of God's word that I want to open up with you this morning is, is the very first part of what's called the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew's Gospel, Chapter 5. Matthew's Gospel, Chapter 5. I'm telling you that, so if you want to have it open in front of you, you can. Some folks like to see it in front of them, others just like to listen, however you wish. The Sermon on the Mount may well be the most famous block of teaching we have from Jesus in all of the Gospels. It's in the Sermon on the Mount that you find phrases that people still even use today, even if they know nothing about Jesus. Phrases like salt of the earth, turn the other cheek. Phrases that you still have in English come from the Sermon on the Mount. Let me state some really obvious things. It's called a sermon because it's a, it's a chunk of teaching from Jesus. Three chapters, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It's called the Sermon on the Mount because we read at the beginning of chapter 5, Jesus went up on a mountainside. And that's where he gave this teaching. And if you're looking in the uh, Bibles in English, you probably see the heading there in Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes the Beatitudes, and that's the name given for the very first part of the Sermon on the Mount. Beatitude is a, I guess, it's a funny sounding word to us. It, it's an old word. It, it means blessing. That's what it means, blessing. If you have beatitude, you are blessed. That's what the word means, and uh, you, you, if you know it, you'll know it well. Jesus keeps coming back to this line in these Beatitudes. Uh, blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. He says it nine times. Uh, and I'm just going to focus on the very first of these Beatitudes, because there's, there's more than enough in each one of these Beatitudes for, uh, for one sermon. But let, me, let me read them all so we just kind of get the picture, and it'll be the first one that we're going to focus on this morning. So I'm reading from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, from verse 1. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. May God bless the reading and preaching of his word. Amen. So verse 3 is our focus, that first beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is is the the kingdom kingdom of heaven. Now, of course, if the Lord is going to apply this rightly into our lives this morning... uh, Obviously, the first thing we need to understand is, what does this word blessed, that Jesus keeps repeating, what does it really mean here? Let me say what it does not first and foremost mean here. It does not first and foremost mean feeling blessed or feeling happy. Now, if you are objectively blessed, you may feel blessed and happy. But it is possible to be, as it were, objectively blessed by the Lord, but because of whatever's going on in your life and your heart or your, or your mind, not to feel it. The particular Greek word that Matthew used when he first wrote this gospel in Greek, the word that's translated here is blessed. If you read the big books on this, they all kind of agree. They say it means something like commended, doing well. To be congratulated. I read a couple of people writing about this say, um, there's a phrase that Australian people use that kind of captures the sense of, um, of this word blessed. Are there any Australians here this morning? Okay, fair enough. You, you may have met one or two Australian people. Um, apparently there's a phrase they use, have you ever heard this from an Australian? Good on you. You ever heard that kind of thing? Okay, Kiwis as well. Maybe you've got the job you've always wanted and an Australian, men, Australian friend might say, good on you. Or maybe your Australian friend is broke, they've got no money, so you give them money and you help them out. And they say, good on you. That's something close to what Jesus means here by blessed. It's not first of all what you feel on the inside... It is an objective verdict on your life, on how you live, on the state of your heart. That's what Jesus means when he said, blessed are. Now, up front, I, I want to say where I'm not going to go in this sermon. Here's what the message from this first beatitude, verse 3, here's what the message is not going to be. It's not going to be primarily... Christians, you know, you've got to pull your socks up and get with this program, otherwise there will be some major blessings from God that you're going to miss out on. That is not going to be the main message from Jesus in these Beatitudes. Because look in verse 1, who Jesus is speaking this to. It says, uh, verse 1, verse 2, His disciples, the people who were following him, they came to him and he began to teach them. He's talking to people who have committed themselves to following him. And he says to them in verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for, here's why, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven is Matthew's particular way of talking about the kingdom of God. So just think about that. He says, these people called the poor in spirit, they are the people who the kingdom of God belongs to. Now, think about that for a bit. The kingdom of God belongs to who? If somebody asks you who's in the kingdom of God, you're going to say, it's Christians. It's the people who follow Jesus. Every Christian. There, There is no single Christian who is not in the kingdom of God. To be a Christian is to be in the kingdom of God. 
So, if the kingdom belongs to those who are poor in spirit, you see what that means? The poor in spirit is just who? Christians. People who follow Jesus. No one left out. So the poor in spirit, it's not some special category of super Christians who are doing super well right now. The poor in spirit is just Christians who follow the Lord Jesus. So if you are a Christian this morning, Jesus sees you and he says, you already are among the people I'm talking about when I talk about the poor in spirit. So as you look, if you look through the rest of these Beatitudes, you, re, you may read on and you may hear about blessing promised to the merciful and doubt that that is really you. Or you may hear about blessing promised to those who are pure in heart and think, that sure doesn't feel like me. But, but that doubt and that feeling, they are leading the Christian astray. The big message from Jesus here for the Christian in the Beatitudes is comfort. It is reassurance. The blessing in the second half of every single one of these Beatitudes is already yours. Eternally, certainly, always yours. Now, it's a blessing that will grow. It's a blessing the Lord will give you more of now and in eternity. But it is a blessing that is surely yours if you follow Christ. Just because you already are the kind of person talked about in the first half of every beatitude. So it is comfort and reassurance for the Christian. This is already you. This is simply yours. And what is the job for the rest of life? Stay like this. Don't lose who you are. Just, just become more of who you already are. Don't go off and turn into something else. Now, I've been stressing, this is comfort and reassurance here from Jesus for disciples who are following him, because that's who he's directly talking to here. But it, I just want to say something here, because if you read on to the end of the Sermon on the Mount, the end of um, uh, Matthew's, uh, Matthew chapter 7, something kind of interesting happens. It, it turns out there is a whole crowd of people who are not yet disciples, who are kind of listening in while he teaches this to his disciples. Um, so verse 1 of chapter 5, we've seen it. It says when... Just listen to this carefully. Just go and picture the scene. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down and his disciples came to him and he began to teach them. And you might hear that and think, oh, okay, all these crowds are coming and Jesus is thinking, oh no, it's the crowds again. I, I, want some, I want some kind of cozy secret time just with my followers, so let's go up the hill. But, but that's not how it is. Because at the end of chapter 7, we're not told what the disciples thought of the sermon. Verse 28 of chapter 7, we're told what the crowds thought of the sermon. The crowds were amazed at his teaching. So it turns out the crowds, who are kind of interested, but they've not yet committed themselves to Jesus, they've kind of been there the whole time, sort of hanging around the edge, listening in, earwigging. And we're told they were amazed at Jesus' teaching. So you, you get the scene. Jesus wants to teach his followers, but this a crowd of people who say, I, I, I'm not yet ready to commit myself to you, but I'm interested enough to hear some more. So Jesus is kind of, he's eyeballing his followers while he's teaching them, but he's got, kind of got half an eye on the crowd. There's some stuff that you guys need to know, because if you're going to commit to following me, these are all the blessings you will have. And this is the kind of person you've got to become to be a follower of mine. So I... I'm a visitor among you, so I, I, I don't know you folks, but I want to acknowledge anyone here this morning who's kind of in the shoes of the crowd, if you like. Kind of eavesdropping, listening in to what Jesus says to those who've committed themselves to follow him. Maybe you're someone who's, who's happy to be around Christians. You, you enjoy the people and the life of this church. And you are here kind of listening in and eavesdropping. 
in these Beatitudes, Jesus, he has, he's teaching his followers, but he's got half an eye on you. He wants you to know what someone has to be like to be a Christian. What the blessings are for those who are Christians. And that is hugely important. There are so many misconceptions, I think, over what someone has to do and be like to do this thing called becoming a Christian. Um, where, where we live and go to church, I, I regularly meet people who, I think they know they're not Christians, but they often like coming to church for whatever reason. And one lady said to me recently, actually, Eric and I were talking to her, she basically said, I'm coming to church because it is a tough world out there for kids right now. I've got a young son and I want some help in guiding my young son in going on the right path in life and knowing right from wrong. And I think the church is going to help me out with that. Well now, if she and her son take on board what they hear in church, they will get some help in that, won't they? But here's the thing. And Christians, we know this. That lady and her son, they could drink in all the knowing right from wrong stuff. Her son could grow up to be hard-working, law-abiding, saying no to drugs, a kind of do-anything-for-anyone kind of person. He could grow up to be that and still yet not be one single step nearer being what a Christian really is. Actually, in all of that, he might have moved even further away from being what a Christian is if he is self-righteous and looks down on others because he's better than them. And I say this because listening in, there might be someone here who is helped in this to understand, okay, that's what this thing is that they talk about when they talk about becoming a Christian. I, I trust that's given you kind of the big picture of what these Beatitudes are for. What kind of impact God can use them to have in our lives? Whether we're already following Christ or whether we know we're not there yet, but we're here kind of listening in. Now, let's dig in a little more. And we're going to, as I said, we're going to zero in on uh, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, as we dig in, let's start with this phrase, poor in spirit. We've looked at what blessed means. Now let's think about what poor in spirit means. We've already seen that's not some category of super Christian who's doing super well. It's just Jesus' way of talking about one aspect of who a Christian is. Which aspect of being a Christian is Jesus talking about when he says, blessed are the poor in spirit? Um, is it people who go around saying, I'm worth nothing. My boss hates me. My kids don't respect me. Even the dog doesn't listen to me. Is, is it people who struggle with low self-esteem or shyness? No, 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 that is not what Jesus is talking about when he talks about being poor in spirit. You can have low self-esteem and not be poor in spirit. You can have everybody in the world tread on you and still you're not poor in spirit. The best way, I think, to explain what poor in spirit is is to show you one or two people in the Bible living out the thing that Jesus calls being poor in spirit. Here's the first example. Uh, the parable of the prodigal son. Many of us will know that from Luke's Gospel, chapter 15. Remember the prodigal son? He... In this parable Jesus tells, he's this son, he, he wants to start living the high life. So what he does, so he can pay for it all, he asks his father to have his share of the family inheritance ahead of time, before his dad even dies. I suspect many of us who are fathers think, if my son came to me asking for that, there's going to be a one word, two letter answer, it's, it's going to be N-O. No, but no, not this dad. He gives him the money. The son takes the money, he goes off, and he spends it buying every luxury his eye desires. He spends it on getting every experience that his heart craves. Till one day, the money's all gone, and he is broke. 
And to make it even worse, a famine has hit the area. There's no food. Alive, he gets a job feeding pigs. And now he's looking at what he's feeding the pigs and he's thinking, the pigs are eating better than I am. And Jesus says in the story, he is on his own. There is no one giving him a helping hand. Here's the point. It is right there in the pig farm that his poor in spirit moment comes. And his poor in spirit moment comes when he comes to his senses, says Jesus, and he says to himself, I will go back to my father and I will say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. That is his poor in spirit moment. I deserve nothing. I have wasted every good thing I've been given. No excuses, no pretending. It wasn't somebody else's fault, it was my fault. I've got nothing to bargain with. But Father, I've come back to you, make me one of your servants, that's all I deserve. Now, you see the point, don't you? Translate that into a person's attitude, not to their earthly father, but to their heavenly father, and that is poor in spirit. Let me give you another example. Old Testament now, the man Gideon. He's another one with a, with a poor in spirit moment. In the book of Judges, God says to Gideon, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? And Gideon replies, no problem, Lord. You just went and chose the right guy for that job. Well done, Lord, for not picking any of those losers. Well done for picking me. Is that what Gideon says? Of course it isn't. Gideon says, he's, it sounds very polite in our English Bibles, he says, pardon me, Lord. How can I save Israel? The Lord had said, go in the strength you have. And Gideon says, Lord, if you knew anything about me, you'd, you would know I've got, like, no strength. He says, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh. I am the least in my family. He says, Lord, for that job of saving Israel, Lord, if you want great stuff done in your name, you have chosen the wrong man. My people are the least respected people you could find. I am the biggest loser in my family, Lord. That is poor in spirit. The prodigal son's poor in spirit. Gideon is poor in spirit. And even so is the Lord Jesus himself. Now, of course, we know the Lord Jesus has enormous divine strength in him because he is the son of God. But in a sense, in his earthly life, he is poor in spirit. Jesus doesn't describe poor in spirit in verse 3. He actually lived it out in his own life. Later, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11, Jesus will say, learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. Where do you see that humility? He who is the Son of God was constantly going off on his own to pray to his Father. Constantly seeking his Father's strength and help for the task the Father had set before him. The prodigal son, Gideon, Jesus, do you see how they ultimately paint the picture of what poor in spirit is? So if you described it in words, I think it would be something like this. Poor in spirit, it's not something you feel you are, it is something you just are. Something you just are in, in your attitude, in your basic orientation of your heart before the Lord. Poor in spirit is, Lord, I am empty and powerless before you. Poor in spirit is, Lord, left to myself, I have nothing in me, literally nothing that would force your hand to make me one of your children. Poor in spirit is singing the words of the old hymn, nothing in my hand I bring. How's it go? Thank you. Simply to thy cross I cling. Singing that and having your heart leap up and go, yeah, that, that is me. That is poor in spirit. If you want to use one word that you might say describes poor in spirit people, it would be repentant. Repentant. 
If you've got Matthew's Gospel open, um, if you just look back to chapter 4, verse 17, 417, it says, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Jesus is coming preaching the kingdom of God. It's come near in him. What's the right thing to do when that happens? Repent. And so then in our beatitude, Jesus simply describes what the people are like who when they hear him will repent. They're poor in spirit because they know they need to repent. I need to tell you something that this means. It means that being poor in spirit or not is not defined by the circumstances of our life. Someone can be powerful and mighty and wealthy and successful in everything they do and still be poor in spirit. I mean, that was King David of the Old Testament. He's a king. He's the ruler. In Psalm 40, verse 17, David says, As for me, I am poor and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my help and my deliverer. You are my God. Do not delay. That is a powerful man being poor in spirit. And, and we have to say this, don't we? Someone can be poor materially in life or poor in their health or poor in their life circumstances and yet not be poor in spirit. Because in their heart, they will not come humbly and repentantly to God. The way Gideon did, and the prodigal son did, and David did. So, being poor in spirit, it's not something that is defined by our circumstances in life. But, but we do have to say from the scriptures, our circumstances in life can influence how hard it seems to be for us to be poor in spirit. Because isn't it true, I think we know this, that those people in life who do have all the blessings of health and wealth and success and respect, sometimes they can find it hardest to come to the Lord saying, Lord, everybody else thinks I'm the business. But before you... There is nothing about me that deserves to be your child. My sin is an offence before you. Everybody else looks at me and thinks, he's got the life you want. But Lord, I know I am dead in my sins and I know I need the life that only you can give me in Jesus. That is hard. If someone spends their life striking bargains and striking it rich, it can be very hard for them to kneel before God and say, Lord, the one person in this universe I cannot strike a bargain with and win is you. With you, all I have is nothing to bargain with, just empty, poor, sinful hands to hold out and say, Lord, in your mercy, will you please give me the Lord Jesus and the forgiveness I need? Later in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus will say, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. In our sinfulness, we can make material blessings a reason not to be poor in spirit. So I, I need to say to anyone here who, who has recently had some wonderful blessing in your life from the Lord that makes your life more comfortable and easier. Well, that is wonderful. We praise God for those gifts, don't we? But we, but we need to watch our hearts. We need not to let the richness of our circumstances sap and weaken the poverty of our spirit before God. Every time the world gives us a big win, we praise the Lord for it. And then we praise him that we are not his child because everybody thinks we're wonderful. We are not doing him a favor by being in his church. We are in his church only because he made us alive in Christ when we were dead and empty and helpless in our sins. On the other side, and we know, don't we, from our own experience, from just seeing others, 
it is sometimes people from whom the Lord has taken away health and wealth and success and happiness. It is sometimes those people who find it easiest to be poor in spirit. Easiest to repent and receive with empty hands. I remember from the time when I was a, when I was a pastor, I, I, I took a funeral one time. It was a really tragic funeral. Um, a lady only in her 40s, and she'd been an alcoholic for many years, and she had basically drunk herself into an empty grave. And there, there's a husband and her young kids. Just, I mean, what do you say? So tragic. I'd preached the gospel the best way I could in the funeral. And a- after the service by the graveside, the, the husband, he came up to me and he said, this didn't happen at every funeral I took, but I remember this one. He came up and he said, that message you just spoke about, I'm going to need that. I'll see you on Sunday. And I thought, I wonder if we will. Well, we did. We should not be embarrassed that it is often when someone has had everything stripped from them that they turn to the Lord. I think sometimes people who are not Christians see, they see people turning to the Lord in moments of weakness and suffering and they say, there you go, I always knew Christianity is just a crutch for weak people. I, I think the truth is, it is when someone has had everything stripped away from them It is then that their eyes are finally opened to see who they really are before God. To see who they they have always been before God. But the wealth and the health and the success and the respect kind of blinded them to that. They see who they have always been before God. Nothing to offer him, nothing to bargain with. Just poor, empty, powerless and needing his forgiveness in his life. There are many people I know right now who who are feeling very weak in their lives in one way or another. I mean, just in the people I know and the church family we're members of. um, I I guess it's the same among you here. Um, The last 18 months have brought a lot of people to their knees, haven't they, in one way or another. Um, In my church, there are people who have had loved ones stripped away from them. Others have had their mental health stripped away from them. For others, it's physical health. It is often when we are poor in some way in our circumstances. uh, Poor in our minds, poor in our bodies, poor in our relationships. It is often then, isn't it, that we find the Lord, he has not abandoned us, he is giving us the grace to be poor in spirit. To know how deeply we need him. To know that we are dead in sin if we do not receive Christ. But if we have received Christ saying, I am dead in sin, he has given us everything. Um, If you'll allow me a couple more minutes. There's one last question I just want to address before I'm done. I began by saying for the believer, these words from Jesus are primarily comfort and reassurance this is you this is what you have yes strive to have a little strive to have it more and more but this is you but someone may be hearing this saying i I follow christ but i hear this being poor in spirit and i do wonder if this is really me how do i know this is me i need the reassurance and comfort you were talking about well let me say this um, uh, imagine that moment when you're standing before God. I mean, I, I've, I've heard this said a number of times. I think it's a helpful way of thinking about it. You're standing before God, and he asks you, why should I let you into heaven? Why you into heaven? As a believer, what are you planning to say in that moment? Are you planning to say, you should let me into heaven, Lord, because my parents were Christians and they took me to church? Let me in because I have broken far fewer laws than a lot of people I could mention right now. Let me in because I gave a lot of money to the church. If you are a Christian, I mean, that's abhorrent, isn't it? You're not planning to say any of those things to the Lord in that moment. You are planning to say something like, Lord, I I have got nothing in me to show that I'm worth letting in. I have nothing to bargain with here. 
but you sent your son to die for me and I have trusted in him. So look to him. He's pleading for me. I repented from life without him. I received him. Yet, Lord, you know there have been ups and downs in my life and my faith, but in the end, the story of my life is I persisted with Jesus. That's what you're planning to say, isn't it? Something like that. If that is what you are planning to say, Jesus would look at you and say, you are among the poor in spirit. You know you, you, know you are, verse 3. Because you're not planning to bargain with God about why you should be in heaven. So the, the task now, well, the task is we stick with Christ. We seek to remain poor in spirit, as it were. Isn't that, isn't that remarkable? He fills us with his spirit, so we have the new life of the spirit in us, but on the other hand, we are always to remain poor in spirit. Acknowledging, I have no strength in me other than the strength provided by the spirit of the Lord Jesus who he pours into me. That's poor in spirit. And so we stick with that. Repenting over every sin. Never forgetting being a Christian is all his grace, not my performance from first to last. Staying poor in spirit, staying delighted that Christ came to this world precisely to make himself poor for you so that in him you might be spiritually rich. As I close now, I'm just going to leave a moment of quiet. The, the Spirit may well have taken this word, and this is what he loves to do, isn't it? Press the word in different ways and to different people. We, there may have been something like 15 minutes ago where you thought, that was the message I needed to hear. Let's just, in the quiet, let's just pray for ourselves for, the, before, for, for ourselves before the Lord in the way that is right for you. Then I'll close with a prayer in a moment. Praise you that you, you have enabled us, you have given us the strength in the power of the Spirit to know that we are poor in spirit, to know that nothing in my hand I bring, simply to your cross I cling. And thank you that in the cross of the Lord Jesus is all the strength we will ever need. Will you help us to, to walk this path of being thrilled and delighted to walk in the way the Spirit leads? knowing every day we are poor and needy and need all that you give us in Christ. In his precious name we pray. Amen.